started. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. My name is Anita Kassoff and I'm the director of the Baltimore Museum of Industry. It is a real pleasure to introduce today's program because I'm a huge fan of both Will Holman and Jay Nwachu, whom we'll be hearing from in just a minute. Will is the executive director of OpenWorks, whose mission is to rebuild Baltimore's manufacturing economy from the grassroots up. And Jay is the president and CEO of Innovation, Innovation Works and the president of Ignite Capital, which brings about neighborhood economic development by supporting social entrepreneurs. We're also really fortunate that Jay is a member of the BMI's board of trustees. Both Will and Jay are doing great things for Baltimore. I'm particularly excited about today's discussion because the Baltimore Re Museum of Industry recently added to our permanent collection samples of personal protective equipment produced by OpenWorks. And as you'll hear in a minute, that PPE was produced through a unique effort by OpenWorks that engaged makers all over the country at a time when frontline workers were in desperate need of protective equipment and traditional supply chains couldn't keep up. The BMI collects and preserves the material record of Baltimore industry past and present. So when researchers many decades from now study the great COVID pandemic of 2020, I'm pleased that they'll be able to turn to the BMI to learn about how OpenWorks responded. The museum's collections and exhibitions, as well as programs like today's, are made possible thanks to the generous support of our members and donors. If you'd like to find out more about supporting the BMI or becoming a member, I encourage you to visit our website. Your support will help ensure that we can continue to engage people in important conversations like the ones we're, the one we're looking forward to today, and also that we can continue to preserve Baltimore history as it's being made. Um, a few bits of housekeeping before we begin today's presentation. This discussion is being recorded and will be posted on the museum's YouTube channel in the coming days. Your camera and microphone are turned off, but we welcome your participation. So please use a Q&A feature along the bottom edge of your screen to submit questions and let us know if you're having any technical difficulties through the chat function. We anticipate this uh, discussion will wrap up by about 1 p.m. And now it is my pleasure to turn things over to Will Holman and Jay Nwachu. Great, well, thank you so much for that warm introduction, Anita. And um, we're just gonna jump right into some slides here. So if you bear with me for one second while I get it set up. All right, can everyone see okay? Uh, drop a note in the chat if you can. All right, so first off, a little bit about our organizations. If you're not familiar, OpenWorks is a nonprofit makerspace, and our mission is to make tools, technology, and the knowledge to use them accessible to all. We accomplish this through membership access to industrial workshops, a wide variety of classes for both young people and adults, and rentable studio space for small businesses, startups, and nonprofits like Innovation Works. Uh, Jay, you want to speak a little bit about Innovation Works? Uh, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Innovation Works, our mission is to uh, reduce Baltimore's neighborhood and racial wealth divide. And we we do that by finding ourselves at this intersection of community economic development and supporting social enterprises, which are businesses in Baltimore that lead with mission of addressing uh, some of the challenges that we have in Baltimore, such as creating jobs or solving uh, challenges for communities that have them. Um, and ultimately our goal is to help rebuild economies in Baltimore through uh, mission-driven businesses. Great. And so one of the challenges that Jay helped us solve last year was uh, getting our frontline workers protected against COVID-19. So. so this is really a story about how we stood up a manufacturing company in five days produce product for four months, and then shut it down. In a way, it's a case study for both what OpenWorks and Innovation Works does day in and day out for Baltimore's entrepreneurial community. Um, it's just that we were using our own facility and systems to do it ourselves instead of helping a, a client or a member do it. So to run through a quick timeline of the events of last spring, on March 16th, facilities like ours were shut down by order of Governor Hogan. 
And then uh, later that week, as it became apparent that this was going to last longer than a week or two, um, unfortunately, OpenWorks had to furlough all of our part-time staff, which was 22 folks. The next day, which was a Saturday morning, we posted to social media. Um, a couple of our members had forwarded us images of this face shield that you see, which was an open source design developed out of the Czech Republic for 3D printing the headband at the top and the bottom reinforcement, and then the shield itself was laser cut um, plastic. So I posted that image and said, hey, if you've got a 3D printer at home, would you be interested in helping us make these? We have 12 3D printers at OpenWorks, but once we did the math on it, we realized we'd only be able to make a couple dozen a week at, at that rate. So by the end of the weekend, that post had gone viral. We had all these people signing up in a Google form. And so I called Jay or Jay called me. Those days are a little hazy. Um, and we partnered up to, to kind of take a three-part approach. We engaged this group called We the Builders to manage part intake. OpenWorks was gonna do the manufacturing. And then our friends at InnovationWorks was gonna kind of handle the distribution. That was the back envelope business model. Um, we reached out to a lot of friends and partners, and, and in my case, family, to help us with a number of these items. So uh, my wife and my brother helped brand the project and create a bunch of the print collateral. Um, my sister and brother-in-law helped draft up the volunteer uh, waivers. And then our internal team set up an intake form for volunteer printers um, to, to volunteer to help. So that Monday, I believe it was, or Tuesday, we finished our first prototype, which brought us to this very important step, which um, Jay can speak to, which is customer discovery and talking to the healthcare systems that would ultimately use the uh, face shields. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, so in innovation works, uh, one of the ways that we think about our work is to look at look at sectors in Baltimore where there's plenty of opportunity for uh, innovation and supporting people who want to create jobs, right? And we think about that looking at value chains and Will just described, obviously, the supply side of it and the manufacturing side of it. Uh, what we really think a lot about how do we actually help people sell things and get it to market. And one of that is this customer discovery process which for us in this case, in an emergency situation was us leveraging the networks that we had uh, to pull together a number of hospital executives uh, to look at the product that OpenWorks was looking to make and provide some feedback on that product. Um, luckily for, you know, because Will and his team had done an incredible job, there was really very little feedback. It was, this is work, it will work. And it's probably one of the best products that actually had seen up until that point um, from a durability standpoint and the way it was designed for comfort uh, which uh, I think it was important important first step to allow Will to start just mass manufacturing these things. It was also good to know that there were institutions in Baltimore that were interested in buying these things in large quantities to give the sense of confidence that everyone needed to continue to press on uh, the effort, uh, which then led into a series of a number of other things, knowing that they need to be a centralized place for folks to find the products. So uh, if you look at the flatten the curve Baltimore website, um, it is not the prettiest website ever because it was designed overnight, but it served its purpose in making sure our folks knew where to find spec sheets, pictures, a variety of products, and also uh, where to purchase the products, which then helped to streamline information gathering and getting folks to um, submit orders. Uh, and then from there, you know, the, we had to hurry to put up a bunch of back office systems in place to make sure as orders came in, Will's team got the information that they needed and they were able to get products back out on the back end to help us then work on the other side of the equation, which was around distribution and shipping and things like that. So um, it was a lot over the first couple of months kind of get those kinks worked out. But um, overall, I think um, uh, all the organizations involved did a pretty decent job in pulling this together uh, to meet the need of the folks who needed these products. I would, I would just add, we learned a couple really important things from that call that Jay organized. The number one question we had was whether this had to be a sterile product. And there was a lot of talk swirling around on Facebook and other internet forums with other maker groups doing this around the country about whether that was necessary or not. So we learned, number one, did not have to be sterile. It just needed to be clean. 
So that removed us from any sort of FDA type approval barriers that we wouldn't be able to surmount in a short amount of time. And then two, um, what the price point was going to be. So as I recall, folks were used to paying around a dollar, dollar fifty for the face shields that you may have seen at mass fax sites, which are just like a piece of foam and like kind of a flimsy piece of plastic in front, like the disposable ones. So when we explained, well, gosh, about the cheapest we could do this was six or seven bucks, a lot of people kind of gasped. So that's when we had to explain what well, was reusable and come up with a sanitation protocol, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. So March 26, now that's just five days after we put out the initial social media call, um, we shipped our first case to St. Joe's up in Towson, part of the University of Maryland medical system. Um, so here's one of our early deliveries getting ready to go. One of the cool things about this is since they were printed by volunteers at home, um, the face shields ended up in all colors of the rainbow. So a few days after that, I completely debased myself on social media um, to raise about $20,000 for the project through crowdfunding. I, I pledged publicly, much to my regret, that I would uh, shave my beard in a comical way. So I went through, you can go back and find the posts, they're still up shave my beard in like six different configurations. Um, this one was the Burt Reynolds. It was the crowd favorite based on the comments. Um, so just to explain the business model a little bit, we raised some grant money to cover overhead, you know, keeping the facility open, et cetera. And then we sold the face shields roughly at cost and that covered the direct cost of manufacturing them. So the labor of, hiring some of our part-time folks back, materials, et cetera. So by early April, we were bringing in an average of 300 some headbands a day. And this is a picture of our lobby vestibule with all the tagged and bagged um, contributions from volunteers at home. We were making close to 500 a day. So we made up the difference between what our volunteers were contributing and what we were able to put out the door by manufacturing our own headband design on our CNC router. So this design basically copied the Prusa form factor but used um, CNC routed acrylic instead of 3D printed um, uh, material for the headband. We still needed to use the 3D printed bottom reinforcement. What this allowed us to do is we could yield 98 or 99 of those headbands out of a four by eight sheet of plastic. And we could cut that in about an hour and a half. So that immediately helped us scale production. We were running into serious supply shortages of all these items. Plastic was in high demand, still is. Elastic was hard to find. So we were kind of constantly playing a game of calling different suppliers, making sure we had enough plastic. So in early May, the USDA reached out to us about creating a hard hat mounted um, face shield for their meat packing and dairy plant inspection workforce. This was a unique challenge because um, A, we were not any type of licensed government contractor. B, the turnaround time was incredibly quick. And C, they had a lot of pretty rigid design requirements. But we were able to prototype a, a, a workable um, version in just three days, send it over to their Baltimore field office for approval. And then we got our first formal, formal order seven days later. So this is a picture of the CNC routed clip that fit into the hard hats that they issued. There's a left clip and a right clip. So we can just route right in there, which one it was. And then the rest of the headband went together, uh, face shield went together just like the conventional design. So on June 12th, um, we wrapped up. We made a total of 28,000, a little over 28,000 face shields, about half of which went to the USDA. But that was not the only work getting done in the PPE space. So I'll pitch it back over to Jay to talk a little bit about that. Oh, sorry about that. 
Um, so, I mean, Innovation Works uh, started working with OpenWorks on this effort, and roughly about a month later, there were other organizations who were looking to, you know, pilot some other products, uh, which we then helped kind of replicate some of the same efforts that we had gone through with OpenWorks to support their own efforts as well. Uh, that was really in the areas of a, a different type of um, uh, a face shield product and also face masks uh, being made by Soul Labs, which is right across, around the corner from uh, OpenWorks. Uh, and, and through these three organizations of many, which were working on uh, efforts like this across uh, the city, um, they, they, they became this really community of makers that were really just pushing on trying to supply the needs of the folks, uh, of those institutions and communities that need these products over time. Um, I think, uh, yeah, over the, over the last couple of months, we actually were able to get out the door through the collaborative effort of these organizations, roughly 100,000 units of products. Uh, about 90,000 of that was face shields and 10,000 was face uh, uh, masks uh, that went to places like the Amtrak um, police force, which bought like, I don't know, a thousand fa uh, face masks or something like that. And they kept driving back from Philadelphia to Baltimore to pick them up in their trucks and go back to Philadelphia which was pretty interesting. Um, and those efforts continued through the summer into the fall uh, when things started winding down a bit. And, you know, Will, oddly enough, uh, the last batch of your facial product are going out the door next week, all 2,000 of them to DC public schools, uh, which, and that will be it. We'll be depleted with the inventory. You probably should know that. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. This is a project with a long tail. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So, so this poster um, we had made up by Baltimore Print Studios on Earth Avenue as part of our reward package for our volunteers. Um, but I think it really encapsulates um, kind of this joint effort, especially what Jay was able to accomplish uh, with and made in Baltimore with the wider community of makers and small manufacturers in Baltimore. Uh, made in Baltimore also worked with some groups making isolation gowns. Um, and a little more complex medical equipment. Uh, we did some higher end 3D printing for some prototype COVID tests being developed over at Hopkins, didn't make it into wider production. But there's a whole universe of kind of cottage industry, which really illustrated when global supply chains are stretched to the point where they snap, that there is local capacity to do all this. And the longer term question, as Jay will attest, is whether our, our local purchasing community and anchor institutions have an appetite to keep participating with these businesses um, even after kind of cheaper overseas manufacturing options come back online. So a little more about how it worked, uh, the, the actual manufacturing process. So We the Builders is a group that normally makes crowdsourced art projects. This is a screen cap from their homepage. If you look in the lower right, this project, We the Rosies, came out in 2017. I believe OpenWorks participated in it. It is a six foot tall sculpture of Rosie the Riveter and is made of, what they do is they model it in the computer and they blow it up into essentially 3D pixels. And then you can claim one of those parts, print it, you mail it to them, they glue it together and it makes giant sculpture. Well, the, this whole interface they come up with to track individual parts made by a distributed network of printers is exactly what we needed in the moment to track uh, part intake. When we were setting this up, we thought the chain of custody of parts might be really important for uh, kind of proving sterilization and stuff. As time wore on, that became less important. But what it did do is provide us with a rich database that allowed us to precisely track how many parts every single printer made so we could calculate reward levels and other stuff at the end. If we had so chosen, we could have also figured out how to do micro payments based on this kind of data intake. So we collected the parts, we'd sanitize them in our UV oven, and then assemble them with laser cut visors and, and um, elastic and then package. And then Innovation Works did all of the distribution and back end um, payment processing and so forth. So Jay, I don't know if you wanna speak a little bit more to some of the institutional relationships that were important, especially early on. 
No, for sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the customer discovery phase really started with the hospitals and they been, became some of the first clients and not just in Baltimore, actually. So uh, Will already spoke to St. Joseph's Hospital and then there were others like um, Adventist Hospital in Silver Spring. There was, a, uh, there was probably the second or third customer, quite frankly. And then it either worked from the large institutions into some of the smaller practices around um, in the academic environment. So the School of Pharmacy, University of Maryland, or School of Nursing, or you had departments within a hospital system who were buying for their own specific unit because they didn't know what was happening at the broader hospital level. And I mean, the idea was that we went from folks just buying from small businesses in Baltimore to just take care of their staff all the way to institutions and the numbers uh, uh, varied greatly. I'll also say that the face shields went as far as Oregon in California and as far as the West and as far as South as Florida as well. So the, the distribution network was really wide. I and Will, you spoke a little earlier to um, uh, the, the, the appetite for local institutions to continue to support something like this. We actually did a survey of the folks that we sold to um, across uh, locally and across the country. And the overwhelming feedback was if price and quality were not a factor, we would love to continue to buy from Baltimore. It's even folks that were not from Baltimore because of the mission around job creation and maintaining employment. Um, so we know that there are some lessons that we we'll continue to lean on uh, and continue to help also work with local manufacturers to think about how they are uh, producing products for institutions to buy and what the middle challenges are going to be around closing the gap between, you know, you probably need some subsidy to get makers to a place where they can sell in, at scale but then the folks who want to buy from them also have a responsibility to help them get to that place so that we can close that gap a little bit more. So a lot of insights there, um, but we, we, we recognize that the institutions locally, especially have, a, have played a significant role in the success of this effort. And we hope that they will continue to think about what that looks like moving forward. Great. So on to the actual production process. <clears throat> So first we would intake parts. Uh, people were printing these all over Maryland and then we had some shipped in from out of state from people that heard us through the heard about us through the We the Builders um, mailing list. So they would come typically in Ziploc bags with a part number written on the outside. We would log that into an intake form where it would later be matched up with the person's name and address, et cetera. We started sanitizing them when they first came in using a solution of alcohol and water, which was made by one of the local distilleries, the Baltimore Whiskey Company over in Union uh, Collective. So that's another part of this PPE ecosystem. Uh, Peabody Heights, Charm City Mead Works, Mount Royal Soaps, Baltimore Whiskey Company, they all turn their distilling equipment and soap making stuff into hand sanitizer and other products during the height of this. So we were able to source locally pure uh, food grade alcohol, which was really hard to find. Well, wet sanitizing the parts was a huge pain because then you had to wait for them to dry and it was messy and whatever. So our friends at MICA built this really cool um, UV cabinet uh, to sanitize the parts. Again, it's kind of hard to remember now because so much has changed, but back then in late March, early April, we had no idea what might be a vector for getting sick. Uh, clearly masks were required, but at the time people were real concerned about touching stuff as well and touching doorknobs. If we had to do this over again, we probably would skip the sanitizing. It took a huge amount of time and probably didn't really need to be done. But next step, uh, elastic. We tried a couple methods to speed this up. It was really hard to find a way to do this um, quickly. You had to manually put slits in the end of the elastic to get it to interface with the headband. Now, Two weeks ago, I went over to So Lab, which is a block south of here, to pick something up. And lo and behold, they had invested in an automated elastic cutting machine for their face masks. And I said, Jeremiah, where were you? Where were you with this a year ago? But uh, it's a beautiful machine that could snip perfectly, perfect 12 inch lengths um, ad infinitum. Then we have five lasers at OpenWorks, um, one of which was bought for this project with a grant from the Baltimore Development Corporation. We had all five running all the time. 
um, and we could cut uh, between eight and 900 visors a day, assuming no equipment breakdowns. The type of plastic we're using for these visors cuts very dirty, which meant that we kept dunking up our lenses and the machines need a lot of TLC. Um, so that kind of slowed us down a little bit. Then assembly, headband, bottom reinforcement, elastic and visor, they all snapped together without fasteners. The most annoying part of this process was peeling the little cling film off of all the visors, which was on both sides and you kind of need tweezers to start because we were all wearing latex gloves the whole time. Um, and then they were each put in a plastic sleeve and then boxed. And then Jay organized a network of volunteers to distribute. So Jay, do you want to talk a little bit about all the these sort of uh, volunteer flotilla that would show up in their cars? <laughs> yeah. These? <laughs> uh, that was, yeah, yeah, was, this is another part of it. This was funny. Um, so, I mean, there was originally this Calendly link that was set up to your order so that when you placed an order, you received an email, it's got just some time to go pick up. And then what happened was at OpenWorks, you had cars just lining up around the block trying to get things, which then became another, you know, nightmare because you're thinking too many people, cross-contamination, who's touching what. Um, so we had to refine that system a little bit and try to maybe just have two people coming through every hour to pick up things, which worked out a little bit better. And then in some cases, you know, you can't expect a hospital team to deploy folks to come pick up a thousand or 500 face shields when they're in the middle of, you know, trying to solve a bunch of crisis in a hospital environment. So we were able to rely on a, on a, on a handful of volunteers who were just looking for some way to help. And when we put out a call for volunteers within our network, a few folks stepped up and said, hey, I have a minivan or I have a truck. If you have some things that need to be delivered, please just let us know. And we actually had a few runs from Baltimore to Washington, D.C. with volunteers just loading up things in their trucks on personal vehicles and delivering face shields, especially to the healthcare environments where folks just could not get out of the hospital system to go pick up face shields. And that was incredibly helpful. And it just showed the, the enormous... Um, the, the, the spirit that folks in Baltimore had about finding a way to contribute when the, the otherwise confusion and, and frustration uh, was, was swung all over the place. Yeah, and I would add to that that one of the things that fell through the gaps that Innovation Works was really good at connecting with was the big systems have access to whole purchasing departments and procurement agents and long relationships with suppliers. Um, Innovation Works was able to connect with a whole bunch of smaller organizations that were desperate for PPE that were not considered high on the priority list for official channels that were being produced. So Catholic Charities, they run a bunch of homeless shelters. Those frontline workers, social workers, people running the food kitchens, all that processing and intaking um, people experiencing homelessness they're locked out of that supply chain and they can't order 500 cases of something. So being able to connect those type of frontline agencies, um, we serviced a whole bunch of those, both through donations and purchases. Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition, which works with people experiencing addiction. Um, uh, Jay, there's a bunch of others. I don't know if I'm, I'm probably missing a bunch, but if you want to yeah, talk that gap a little bit, I think that's important. Yeah, you know, so like folks like Central Baltimore Partnership had to work with their own partners to get face masks and shields for some of the senior resident communities. The folks in you know Rebuild Johnson Square had to do something similar. There were some um, uh, other nonprofits who were serving other vulnerable populations who had to go find small grants here or we donated a bunch, quite frankly, to some of those groups. And one of the things we were trying to also monitor for is that we didn't allow the big hospital system to just buy up everything as they were coming off the production line. And we had a reserve system to make sure we had some so that it could be accessible to smaller organizations. And for the smaller organizations, I mean, it, it, it was, you know, it requires a whole lot more work when you're trying to box up, oh, we only need, you know, uh, 12 for our team. But we're selling them in a box of, I don't know, 50. And then, then trying to think about how you then start splitting these things up because they couldn't buy, afford to buy more than they needed. So there are a lot of adjustments that we had to make to make sure that folks got what they needed in communities, um, which was quite frankly, probably one of the best part of the experience was to make sure we met folks where they, they were needed. 
uh, where, where they needed us. Um, and it might require a little bit just extra work, but it was, it was good to do that. So by the numbers here, um, we averaged a production of about 500 and we peaked at 845. We had trouble ever getting over 900. Um, and that was because we, I, the nice way of putting it is we applied lean production principles. So lean is a system of manufacturing came out of Toyota in the seventies and eighties and is now a methodology that's applied to things beyond manufacturing. But it basically says you keep a very tight supply chain with just the stuff on hand that you need for a limited period of production. And you're constantly pushing end product out the door. It's kind of the opposite of Ford's attempt to totally vertically integrate when they began making the Model T and they owned everything from the rubber plantation to the steel plant. Um, this allows you to really bring costs down. In our case, the lean was partly by design in that we don't have a lot of space to stockpile stuff, et cetera, but part of it was by accident. All of our typical suppliers, prices and availability was going haywire for all types of plastics and materials. It still is. Um, we'd get wildly different quotes for acrylic day to day. We were lucky to secure a thousand four by eight sheets of the face visor plastic in the first week of lockdown, because after that, we couldn't find that stuff for almost six weeks. Um, so part of this variation is just literally based on, we didn't have enough stuff to keep making uh, face shields that day. Uh, and some of our days where it dipped below 200, it's because we um, ran out of elastic and we're spending the afternoon looking on eBay for anyone that had some, some elastic to spare. So at the end of the process, we then developed is you can think of it like a Kickstarter in reverse. Instead of people supporting the project up front and getting their reward at the end, people supported the project up front with no expectation of reward other than um, trying to help their community. And we developed a reward system um, so coffee from our in-house coffee roaster, thread, uh, t-shirts, posters, postcards, um, a bunch of fun stuff, and it's all made by local makers. So the BMI collected some of that ephemera alongside of all of, well, some of our face shields. So here's some of the museum staff coming to box up some of the stuff a couple weeks ago. Um, the Maryland Center of History and Culture, the former Maryland Historical Society also took a couple face shields for their uh, collection. And in talking to both museums, one of the interesting things was that they both remarked that they had little to nothing in their collection to do with the 1918 flu because nobody thought to collect any of it. And a lot of it is sort of ephemera like masks that just got thrown away and was lost to history. So. This is an opportunity to hopefully uh, preserve some of that legacy going forward as Anita mentioned up top. So replicability, uh, I think that gives uh, both me and Jay a little heartburn, um, maybe something more severe depending on the day of the week. Um, so worldwide, we were part of a much bigger effort. Uh, this. This group, Open Source Medical Supplies, which started as a Facebook group devoted to designing an open source ventilator last March, eventually became a sort of umbrella online organizing group around grassroots maker PPE production generally. And they put out an annual report about a month and a half ago. And this shows the amazing diversity of what maker groups were producing. Now, the majority of it was face shields, isolation gowns, and cloth masks. But if you start to look down the list, it's pretty amazing that some of these groups with little formal help from anyone were developing you know, N95 level respirators um, or, or more complex things like paper hoods, which have a full-on ventilation unit attached to them. They worked on a variety of different models. Some people charged for their PPE, some did on grants and donations, some were totally um, informal. 
one thing that almost all these other groups shared is that they were vertically integrated. So it was basically a makerspace or a group working together with the tools that they had at their disposal. Very few of them followed this kind of crowdsource model where we were able to increase our production base by tapping into people that had 3D printers at home. So this is the basic model. Again, distributed production, then we as the makerspace sort of pulled all the parts together and then innovation works worked as an aggregator because we were again we're not the only producer on their flatten the curve um, website so that anyone going to that website could choose from a bunch of different PPE and then helped us get it to the customer. So Against probably my better judgment, back in January, OpenWorks launched a second project under the Makers Unite brand following a similar model using um, what we learned from the face shield project. Our in-house contract services team designed this beautiful flat pack plywood desk after we learned that a lot of students in Baltimore City were struggling with remote learning and didn't have a place to learn from. The district had done a good job of getting devices out to everyone, um, but if you're trying to learn from your bunk bed or your couch or the kitchen table, uh, you lack some dignity and respect um, for yourself in the process. And you're also much likely to lose or break that device because it doesn't have a home. So we launched a sign up form on January 20th, shut it down a couple of days later after getting over 4,000 requests. And we've been fulfilling about 60 requests a week since then. And last week we crossed 700 desks uh, distributed to Baltimore City students. We're actually distributing through schools, not to individuals. So we delivered 20 at a time to different schools around the city, and then they get them out to their students. Um, this has been underwritten by crowdfunding primarily, and then some corporate support from ShopBot, Stanley Black & Decker, and BGE. So uh, some folks have suggested this might be a permanent need given how massive the need was once we put the question out there. And we may start making them on a, on a more semi-permanent basis. So that is the bulk of the presentation. I'm going to X out of the presentation and we can take some questions now. Well, there's a question in the Q&A box. Do you see that? Great. So can you share a bit more about how this project partnership has influenced the way you work as individual organizations and partners? What will you carry forward with you into the pan post pandemic time? Uh, Jay, you wanna take the first crack at that? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, for us, you know, the core of our work is supporting social enterprises that hopefully create jobs and address you know, challenges that we have in the city. Uh, this for us was confirmation that um, we have the talent, many assets in Baltimore uh, that we need really to, to help lift our own communities up uh, and that we have a marketplace out there that is willing to support that. Um, there's often this gap in between of connecting those things, the opportunity and the challenges. And this was a pressure cooked effort that really validated a number of the assumptions that if we took the time to really figure out what that gap was in the middle, that there's a lot of opportunity for Baltimore. Um, the one number that I had not mentioned earlier was, you know, this effort across just the three organizations, not just, not all the efforts across Baltimore around PPEs generated about half a million dollars in revenue. That most of that went to payroll in a pandemic where people were losing jobs. That is really, really important to note because much of the products, products that were being made were being sold relatively at cost so it was really payroll and cost of the materials you needed and not much profit because everyone was really trying to support their workforce and also meet a, a, a need at the time. So for us, confirmation that this is there's a there there is really important. Um, and also recognizing that if we're going to create jobs for folks in Baltimore who don't have high fancy degrees, who have been locked out of work opportunities, 
the space of light manufacturing, especially, is still a, a space that can grow in Baltimore and it can create a whole bunch of jobs if we just look for where the opportunities are. In our pipeline, we have a, a good amount of makers that, that we support as social enterprises. A lot of the lessons that we uh, picked up along this journey is something we're thinking about how we apply to them and supporting them to make sure that the products that they're making, whether it's you know your own handmaids and, and soaps and beauty products or other folks who are making more textile-based um, uh, 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 products, that we help them use the same principles and lessons learned to help increase their potential uh, market share and therefore create more impact and job creation uh, for communities that need it. That's, that's the biggest one for me. Another is the feedback that we've gotten from the institutions that yes, if there was a concerted effort to try to solve those pain points in the middle, that there was significant interest. I'm also no fool. I know that there have been efforts in the past to try to bridge the gap between manufacturers and buyers and you know things just haven't worked out as well as we would like to. So we're in conversations with the made in Baltimore's of the world to just kind of figure out, you know, what other creative ways can we a, 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 a approach that challenge uh, and try to find a way to increase more economic opportunity for local businesses and uh, the folks that will work for them. Yeah, hundred percent to follow on Jay's comment. I think we had all worked in partnership a lot before the pandemic. And so it served us well when we had to kind of switch some capabilities on quickly. So I think it just confirmed that working together in community is better than the alternative. Um, but the, the piece about connecting the larger scale buyers to our makers, I, I just want to reiterate. So we're in a new age of manufacturing and kind of a lot of the things that the Museum of Industry looks back on um, and, and has in their collection and celebrates is like a type of manufacturing that doesn't exist in Baltimore a whole lot anymore, like large scale steel ship and auto production or like oyster cannery production. The future manufacturing is kind of this type of model, which is light footprint distributed using a very taut supply chain and in many cases is open source. It doesn't have protectable IP, kind of the traditional value that a manufacturer would take to market is getting upended by the internet and kind of new models of thinking about how we make and consume products. And uh, I'm personally really interested in that avenue of making, but to make it work, we've got to connect all the the little guys. So pre-pandemic, OpenWorks had a little over 50 small businesses based out of our studios. And how do we connect those people to the, to the Johns Hopkins and the Baltimore city government and the type of buyers that allow them to scale up from being one or two or three people to being a, a company that employs people and has its own space? So did that answer the question? I hope so, answer in the chat if it did. Um, the second question here is, in what ways do you think this project was unique to its specific time, i.e. a crisis? Um, curious about your feelings about uh, materials and processes not related to the urgency of the pandemic. Like, could this model be used, I guess, to fulfill other societal needs? Um, Jay, do you want to take a crack at that first? Yeah, I mean, the, the short answer for us is, uh, you know, yes, this can be applied to other things moving forward. Um, and, and for us, we've spent the last, quite frankly, three months at Innovation Works, uh, accepting the fact that we are now hitting this post-pandemic phase. Right? And part of that is the market says, we don't really need as much face shields anymore because we're moving into vaccinations now. We're not necessarily doing as much testing and, and things, the, the demands have changed. And also the the, the emergency author use authorization from the federal government on some of these products starting to close up a little bit more and we're going to get more stringent. So we knew that was closing up anyway. And it started shifting to, okay, what next? And, and where, where are there opportunities that already existed pre-pandemic? They just were not getting the look that they deserved before. Um, right now, Innovation Works is in, work in two different other projects around um, uh, re use of urban wood, both reclaimed and fresh cut, uh, and, and the opportunities for that in manufacturing in Baltimore, working with a number of partners like US Forestry, uh, and then another uh, project in natural dyes, 
uh, looking from the agriculture community who are doing urban farming all the way to diet processing and then going into products on the back end in multiple um, uh, economic markets from food to textiles to beauty and cosmetics. So we know that there are other assets and many e micro ecosystems in Baltimore that exist um, that we can take the same principles and really apply to that will actually meet more daily needs in perpetuity that is not more of an emergency response. The good news is that, you know, the emergency in itself gave us an opportunity to just test a bunch of things really, really fast, lose a lot of sleep along the way, but come out on the other side of it with some lessons that we think will endure in other spaces that it might've taken us longer to get there, but the, 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 the pandemic was a forcing function essentially. Right. Uh, one thing that to add on to those comments that I think is important about us selling the face shields and, and the masks at like a reasonable market rate is that we also found out very quickly that the, the free market was, was alive and well in late March in, in a really negative way. And one company I talked to on the phone uh, early on was selling face shields for 45 bucks a pop. Now, that's just like one tiny example, but you could look on Amazon. We heard from multiple suppliers that they ordered stuff and spent significant amounts of money on product that never arrived and might have just been a phantom um, all along, or it could have been legitimately lost in the shipping breaks, breakdowns. But either way, two things. Reliability of, of product was not getting delivered either through scam or, or not. And two, people were price gouging out the wazoo. So by providing a reliable, local, fairly priced product, we, we kind of served to equalize the market. And I've thought a lot about that since then, as what is the, uh, how the local manufacturing is often seen as a more expensive, less reliable alternative. And we kind of flipped that on its head last spring, right? But now that the market equilibrium is sort of returning, how do we say, well, wait a minute, maybe relying on this super long and tenuous supply chain just because it's cheaper right now is not the best idea. Because as climate change makes shipping more expensive and other global instability that none of us can control, it, it seems like local institutions and other buyers would, would have a vested interest in kind of building up that capability in their backyard. So that's one thing. The other thing that I think is more interesting, like in terms of the desks, is more directly addressing the needs of, a, of an impoverished audience, which unfortunately a good part, Paul, part of Baltimore falls into, right? Um, if you want a low cost desk, Ikea is always there, but you know what? You can't buy a desk to save your life at Ikea all year long because everyone was working from home, right? And again, those same speculative market forces pushed up prices and pushed up prices for supplies as well. Um, kind of right before Dr. King died, he was working on a uh, the Poor People's Campaign, which was a national campaign. But one vertical of that, that they were trying to set up in the deep south was called uh, something like poor people's factories. Um, it's not super well documented, but I've, I've read what I could find about it. And they were essentially trying to build some version of this, which was like, we're gonna make shoes and clothes and furniture and kind of low cost consumer goods in the communities that need them to circumvent the darker forces of kind of capitalism and, and racism. And part of me thinks that in, in my more grandiose moments that a model like this can serve um, to fill that gap in a way that we until now have relied on just cheap overseas manufacturing where lower labor standards and environmental regulation, all those things make products cheaper. And instead we can say we can pay, pay people a fair living wage in the communities in which they live to make an inexpensive but high quality product that people need and we can get it to them um, for a price or, or for free or for subsidi through subsidized means that make it available to them. I don't really know, it's not really a fully cooked idea, but I do think that 
um, smaller scale distributed hyperlocal manufacturing has a role to play in kind of a, a humanitarian and anti-racist way as well. If, if I could take that and it's plus one it and then add a little extra, right? So when we think about manufacturing and sales and profitability, in, in a sense, we think about scaling your operation, right? How do we sell to large institutions and large numbers? And that's what we think about success. What Will is describing is this microeconomy way of looking at things in a more inclusive economy, economic manner that says, no, we can produce what we need in a more reliable way and therefore keep jobs in our own community as well. And then there's also this middle slice that we often ignore. It's all the medium-sized businesses and the small-sized businesses that need the exact same thing that the institutions are buying, except they don't have the buying power of the institutions. They can't buy a thousand units at a time and have a place to store and therefore drive in the cost of their MOQs down, right? And I think the local makers as a, as a unit, if they when they work together, can actually be a really, really good solution for the mid-market buyers in a Baltimore. I think about not necessarily the large chain hotel, but your boutique hotel and where they're getting their products from and when times get tough, they're competing with the large chain to figure out where they get their things from, when they can have a consistent supply locally right now. And actually then have more products that actually are closer to home in how they experience it. I think about the work that's happening right now in the natural dyes project that we're working on. Folks are growing things in Baltimore with plants that are native to Maryland. And those things can be turned into products that people can use in a Baltimore business or a Baltimore home. I think there's a just a rich story there about what it means to think about inclusive uh, economic models beyond even just the dollar side of it, but the impact in, on jobs created locally, and also just the overall felt experience of using things that you know was made just right down the road from you that created a job at the same time. There's just so much there that I think, the, I mean, you know, these things sometimes seem like grandiose ideas, but they really shouldn't be. It, it, this can be a way of life for Baltimore, really, moving forward. It, it was a way of life, you know, for, for, uh, for in Baltimore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Until about the same. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, well, great. Um, any other questions? All right. Well, um, I think that brings us to the end of our presentation today. I want to say a big thank you to the Baltimore Museum of Industry um, for hosting us, especially to Ani, Beth, and Anita for the direct invitation and setting all of this up. Um, and invite you all to come back and see us at OpenWorks when we fully reopen on July 1. And while you're here, you can pop in and say hey to Jay because he's a tenant here. Yeah. So. Th thanks, landlord. And uh, yeah, hope, please keep buying and supporting local. All right. Great. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Folks. Take bye -bye. care of yourselves. All righty.